Amen. Uh, we're going to get into the word this morning. And last week, if you were with us, spoke a message called the familiarity factor. And today we're, we're just calling it a mini series because we're going to do part two. Next week we have fresh voices coming up. Um, so the familiarity factor. And we sort of touched on a few things last week. If, again, if you missed it, you could go on our YouTube channel and catch it. But basically, if we get too familiar with the things of God, we will treat them as casual and with contempt. And we said contempt is basically, I'm supposed to uh, pay attention to this thing, but I'm actually not even acknowledging it or paying any attention to it. I don't give any account, and I should, though. And that is what we sometimes do when we get too familiar with the things of God. What will happen is we will overlook the very things that God is actually putting in our path. And, and so this morning, we're going to look at a, a specific text. So if you have your Bible, would you open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15? Actually, would you stand, if you're able to, for the reading of God's Word? 1 Samuel chapter 15. And we'll begin reading at verse 1. I'm going to jump right in today. We'll have it on the screen as well in the New Living Translation. And here's what it says. One day Samuel said to Saul, It was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people, Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Verse 3. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Verse 4. So Saul mobilized his army at Telaim. There were 200,000 200, soldiers from Israel and 10,000 men from Judah. Then Saul and his army went to a town of the Amalekites and lay in wait in the valley. Saul sent this warning to the Kenites, move away from where the Amalekites live or you will die with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites packed up and left. Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. But listen to verse 8 and 9. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Hmm. Interesting. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fat calves, and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to who? To them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your anointed word. And Lord, as you're sending it out of my mouth today, I know it will accomplish everything you need it to. Lord, I ask for your anointing upon me. Thank you for this humble privilege that I get to share your word with your people. And I pray that it would be you speaking through me today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. This is a very interesting story today. I don't know if you've ever read through it, but we're going to look at Saul. And God gave him something specific. We just read it. And then when God speaks to you, it's for a purpose. Yes? Yeah. And if he's going to be specific, then how many of you know I should do it not my way, but whose way? God's way. And, but already in these first nine verses, Saul has veered off. And he, Scripture said he kills every one of the Amalekites except for the king. But normally, wouldn't you want to deal with it, number one, from the head? I, that's a bit logical to me. But then after that, I, I want to do it God's way. Yeah. That should be the first way. Yeah. But... He got it all contorted and wrong. He, he kills everything else except for the king. Oh, and then these animals, that everything that looked good to them, they kept. 
and they set it aside. And we're going to come back to the reason why, because Saul has a reason. And I just wonder this morning if some of us in this room, God has spoken to you. He was even specific with you about what. Maybe it's very similar to all his testimony. He's like, no, we're not moving from the number and the house that God has shown us. Amen. And, and I wonder, God has spoken to us. He was even specific. But in the end, we've gone and done what we felt was better. And, and that's some dangerous ground to be treading on. And if you take notes, and I highly encourage you to do it, it not only helps you stay engaged, but it also, you can turn back to your notes in a future time in life and remember what the Lord had taught you this morning. So point number one is familiarity will turn commands into suggestions. Familiarity will turn commands into suggestions because the scripture was very clear in verse 1. Now listen to this message from the Lord. And he's very clear. This is what the Lord says to you. And he tells them exactly what to do. I love it when God is specific. And the way I like, when my wife is specific with me, Jonathan, I'm going to do groceries. I want the bathrooms cleaned. I want the carpets vacuumed and the floors vacuumed and mopped. Guess what? That to-do list motivates me with laser clarity and focus to start going tick, 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 and I get, I get it done. But I love the specifics because if they're laid out, I can follow that. But here, Saul had the specifics, but he didn't choose to follow it. Again, the message is to him in verse 1 that Samuel delivers. And in verse 3, let's, again, just look at how specific. Go. So that's a command, right? Go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. And if that's not clear enough, God even like breaks it down into this bullet form for him. Again, clarity is kindness, I guess. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep. Goats, camels, and donkeys. Very specific. And Saul's response is, well, we're going to do, we're going to slaughter them all. We're going to do exactly what God said. But look at verse 9. Saul and his men spared Agag's life. Who was Agag again? The king of the Amalekites. And he spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, fat calves, and the lambs. And it, Scripture says everything, in fact, that appealed to them. Again, I'm going to remind you, familiarity will turn commands into suggestions. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. In whose eyes? Their eyes. And so if we're not careful, church, familiarity can turn God's commands into suggestions in our own lives. And by the way, the Bible is full of commands, full of commands. We don't have time. It's exhaustive. You can go on and on and on. But in the New Testament, there are two. We know them like we sum them up like this. There's the great commission and the great commandment. Okay, I have the scriptures for that. But I want to really hone in on the great commission this morning. And before we get to that, here's a pattern for, for Christian living. Are you ready? It has to deal with God's word. Start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible. Why? Because this is God's word. Does God still speak by revelation and by prophetic words? Absolutely. But those cannot con contradict his written word. Because God is not a man that he could lie or change his word. So God's word is written for us today that I could read it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in the Word, stay in the Word, and finish in the Word. Why? Or else I'm going to get on some weird doctrine, some weird theology, some weird belief. And, and there are, unfortunately, pastors in pulpits that don't preach the doctrine of the Bible, but preach the weird stuff. And Scripture even is kind enough to warn us, be careful of false prophets or people who preach for those who have itchy ears. And they'll say whatever they want you to hear that feels good for you. God's Word, sometimes it'll soothe your soul and sometimes it'll prick the heart. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit does with the Word of God for us, for our benefit. Amen? Amen. And so the Great Commission, all right, is not the great suggestion. Again, familiarity will take commands and turn them into suggestions. Mark 16, 15, we have it on the screen, it says, And then he told them, Jesus told them, Go, again, there's a command, Go into all the world and preach the good news to who? Everyone. As a, as a believer, you cannot dance around this. It's not a suggestion, and you cannot be a closet Christian who only comes out on Sundays for church. You, in the workplace, that's why at the end of every service, we say, though the service is over, church is not, because we go. And I got to go, and, you know, don't preach while you're paid to work, but you might find moments in your shift or with who you rub shoulders with where you can drop the seed of the gospel. And, and your life's testimony will speak the loudest. You hear me? You don't have to open up the Bible at lunch to... Be, by the way, can you listen? I have a verse. I need to preach it to you. No, no. Let your life be the testimony. And when people take notice, they're going to ask you questions. And then you can say, well, you might see me as a peaceful person, but it's actually because of Jesus in me. He's my Prince of Peace. He's the one who gives me peace in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the storm. And then you introduce Jesus to them. But we have to go. We have to go. Matthew 28 also records this part. Again, Jesus speaking. And verse 18 of Matthew 28, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority where? In heaven and on earth. Therefore, as a result of this authority, he's telling them, now you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And then here's his promise to us. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. So though he's sending us out, go, we're actually not alone. Well, he's with us, so when you're in that lunchroom about to have this heart-to-heart -heart with someone who's asking you questions, guess what? He's with you. The same Jesus who is with his disciples and was sending them out is the same Jesus who's with you at your lunch table when you're about to share with your colleague or at your cafeteria table when our students are back in school. By the way, for my KJV friends, uh, the Bible doesn't say come they, it says, go ye into all the world, right? So here's the thing. The value of church, of what we do here, is there's value when we gather. There is value. Only three of you agree with that. But most of you agree because you're here this morning. I hope it's because you agree. There's value when we gather because if we're not careful, listen to this, we can get too familiar with gathering at the church building. When I say church, I'm saying gathering at the building that we forget to be the ecclesia, the church. And I'm going to break that down. That's why we say, again, the service is over, church is not. What is ecclesia? Ecclesia means called out ones. So called out ones, this is the gathering of the called out ones, the ecclesia. So really, we, we spend a lot of time saying, I'm going to church, when I've, actually we're gathering as the church. And, and really, we're called out, ecclesia, to then be sent right back in. You see that? I'm called out. What, what happens here? We're equipped. We're filled. We're encouraged. We hear testimonies that build up our faith. And then when service is over, I'm the church. And I'm going into the world. Wherever there's darkness, the light needs to shine. And if it's really dark, we need the light to go to those places. And so this is the heartbeat of church. We are gathering, but if we forget, we become too familiar, we will think that the command is only to gather, and we will forget that we're actually commanded to go. And that's the reminder this morning. Are we happy you're here? 100%. 
100%. For church online, we're, we're not saying, like, we're going to continue live streaming our services because there's also value there. We are reaching people who otherwise might never step foot in a church building. But the end goal, even for you watching on the camera today on live stream, isn't just for you to do church by yourself in your comfy pajamas with your mug and marshmallows and hot cocoa. The real point is that you would break out of your shell. You're a called out one. Find a local assembly of believers that you can rub shoulders with, grow together, and then go and change your world. The call is to gather so that you could then go. Ecclesia, called out ones. And if all of that is true, and you believe it, listen, the best part about any church is not the worship or its preaching, it's the people. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And, and I know at Weston we're a loving family, and, but every family has growing pains. Every family has things that we, ha we work through and challenges. But that's the beauty of it, yeah. is that we're not perfect. And so if you're a guest today, by the way, uh, sorry to break the news. If you're looking for a perfect church, we're not it either. <laughs> and, and, and hear me today. Um, we're going to love the best that we know how. Though we've received God's love, so that's what we can dish out and pour out. But the best part of any church is not the worship or not even the preaching or the person doing the preaching. It's the people that have shown up. It's the people that make up the church. It has to be. Why? The preacher is a person, not a church. And a lot of times we make decisions, you know, and if you're here, maybe, I don't know, uh, you've made a decision because you're like, I like the worship, or I like Pastor John's preaching, or Pastor Miguel's preaching, or how they do things. I don't know what was the thing for you, but listen, the preacher is a person, not a church. The worship, they're just, they're, we're ministering together unto the Lord and, and trying to encourage everyone to lift up our eyes. Church online, again, it's a great tool, but that, that's not the end goal. It's a means to going and reaching the world. You know, it was interesting this past week, uh, we had a funeral for Lena, Sister Lena's mother, and I was closing out uh, the visitation time at the funeral home, and um, I just shared a passage of scripture, but with conviction about, hey, moments like this, we have to reflect on our priorities in life. And Scripture, Colossians 3 says, we got to fix our eyes on the realities of heaven. And I just was trying to be of an encouragement to the believers and the family, but also the evangelistic side of, hey, if you've never thought of it, this is the right time. And at the end, there was a, a gentleman who came up, never met him in my life, and he just said, hey, can we chat just for a minute? And his opening words to me were, no disrespect, but he said, I disagree with everything you said. <laughs> and do you think I got offended? Absolutely not. No. Because this is what I, we're all called to do, yeah. is I'm called to share the hope of Jesus. And I happen to be a preacher, and most of it comes in this form. But I also have a life outside of church. I rub shoulders with my neighbor. And, um, and so this young man, I, I said, Lord, give me the words, because I didn't even have, the, how do you respond, right? So if we're going to go, but Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'm with you even to the end of the age. And so I just shared. I didn't get offended. I said, I'm actually grateful. Our time got cut short because he said, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but my ride's actually waiting. And now they're calling. I said, that's okay. I hope we can have another conversation sometime. And that's it. And I don't know what kind of seed was planted, um, but I said, Lord, I, I left actually excited. And I share that to say not everyone's going to want to hear. Again, if we're going to take the command to heart, it's not a suggestion. It, it also means I have to be okay with the rejection and people saying, uh, no disrespect. And I said to him, none taken, none taken, because I'm going to do this whether you like it or not. And it's just a seed. I didn't say that, by the way, right? But that's, that's what I know in my, in my heart, is saying, this, this person, it's okay. They don't, they don't understand the love of God like I've experienced. 
And so, uh, again, familiarity, we've got to be careful. Familiarity will turn commands into suggestions. And so let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, our text. I want to continue reading now because we've just hit the beginning part of the story. It's going to get a little more interesting starting at verse 10. Are you with me this morning? Say amen. amen. Here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to, what, obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. Verse 13, when Samuel finally found him, listen to this, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out all the Lord's command. Is that true? No. Verse 14, then what is all the, the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing, the lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. And I want to stop there just for a minute. It should be blatantly obvious, I would imagine, for Saul that he actually did not carry out the specific command of the Lord. Anyone in the room disagree? No, we agree. It should have been obvious. But listen to his language He's saying, well, uh, and he's greeting Samuel cheerfully as if like nothing happened wrong. But listen, this is very important. Familiarity will not only turn commands into suggestions, but familiarity will turn principles into preferences. Principles into preferences. And I need you to hear this this morning. There's an admission of disobedience in verse 15. He goes, oh, yeah, we we saved some of this, but listen to his justification. He justifies his actions by saying, oh, but they're going to be sacrificed to your Lord, your God. So Saul, though he's the king of Israel, though God anointed him for a specific role and he had a specific assignment... He's actually wandering in dangerous territory. Why? Because he's doing whatever he wants. And when you're the king of God's chosen people, you do things God's way, not your way. Listen, as a son and daughter of the king today, we don't necessarily get to make every decision. It, it It might sting a little, but that's okay. It's not, it's not my word. It's God's word. And, and if you've yielded your life to him then you need to say, Lord, I want your will to be done, not mine. And here Saul is doing whatever he thinks. And and the sad part in all of this is when Samuel shows up, it said Samuel all night he couldn't sleep. This bothered him greatly. And Samuel was the prophet, God's mouthpiece. But Saul was king. And Saul, hey Samuel, what's up? With a cheerful greeting because he has no clue Because that's how far off he's gone. Familiarity will turn principles into preferences. Principles into preferences. I want to continue reading from verse 16 because it gets crazier. Verse 16 says, Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. Like, Like basically stop this madness. Stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you? Saul asked. And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself. So he had some insecurity issues, Saul. And there might be another message I preach out of that text, out of this part. He said, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and told you. So he's reminding him, it's not a suggestion, this was a a command. Go and completely destroy the sinners. The Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord. 
Wow, do you think he's got, he, the script in his mind is flipped. He doesn't see it. He doesn't understand. But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but, so there's the but, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder, again, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And we're going to stop there again. Right? So Samuel's reminding him. He's saying, but don't you remember? Like, why, do you, why are you talking about sacrificing to the Lord these things? Stop. He's like, listen, this is what God has called you to do. He's anointed you in this way for this purpose. And now you're not fulfilling it. And you're doing, yeah, but we did do it. I did do it. It's like, it's almost like talking to a child, like a toddler. No. You didn't do it. Yes, but we're going to sacrifice this. But that's not what you were asked to do. And verse 19 is the kicker. Samuel says to Saul, Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? And his response, But I did obey the Lord. No, Saul, you're dead wrong. Saul is so caught up in his own preferences and his own way of doing things that he actually th uh, th thinks his way is God's way. He's so far gone that he actually thinks his way is God's way. And today I wonder if there are any here within the sound of my voice that you've been doing things thinking they were God's way, but they're actually your way. And maybe you're saying, why hasn't God blessed me? Why, why is this so hard? And why can't I? And you fill in the blank. I don't know your story. I don't know what God has spoken and what he's telling you to do. But what I do know is we ought to obey. Because yeah. that's the one thing that Samuel keeps coming back to. Why did you not obey the Lord? He's so caught up in his own preferences and in his own way of doing things that he thinks his way is actually God's way, but he's wrong. Let's look back to the text in 1 Samuel 15. 22 says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to His voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Listen to the judgment now. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. That's a serious outcome. That's a serious outcome. So he asks the question, what's more pleasing to the Lord? Right? Burnt offerings and sacrifices or simple, plain old obedience? The answer is the obedience factor. If, if I say do this to my son and he does this, is he listening? Is he obeying? No. It's very simple when we, when we look at a child's life. It's much harder when it's our own lives. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to heed his voice. Yeah. And we have to tread carefully with what he's given us and what he's asked of us. Saul's preference was to do what he thought was right and best, which was... Yeah, but I'm going to sacrifice this. That's what I, he thought he was doing a good thing, but the good thing was actual, actually still disobedience. Yeah. And so obedience is better than sacrifice. What does that look like today for you and me? Because no one's walking around with sheep and goats and cattle and saying, God, this is for you. Tsa, tsa. Right? But maybe you're here and you're like, I'm going to give a $5,000 offering because... You know, I want the Lord to see my heart, but meanwhile, you're cheating on your spouse. There's no honor in that. There's no, there's no, God, he'll, he sees the $5,000, but it means nothing to him. Why? Because there's no honor and there's sin in the camp still. I want you to hear Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, just to back up this example that I just used. Jesus' words, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, now verse 28. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust 
has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Because Jesus said, I tell you, if a man even looks at a woman with lust, he's already committed the adultery. So it's not even like the act. It could just be the secret sin. Again, that's maybe an extreme example, but I think it could hit home. Maybe it's not $5,000, but maybe it's like, well, I'm going to join Dream Team because I want to do good and give back with my time and serve, you know, whatever ministry, but yet I'm still going to live this life of secret sin that no one else knows. I'm still going to, you know, secretly uh, get drunk on Friday and Saturday nights, but hopefully sober up enough to serve at church on Sunday because I'm doing it for God, and I want to do good and give back, right? Who said to do that? God, yes, he wants you in his house, God's heart, he's for you, not against you. But we get it backwards and twisted when we get too familiar with principles in God's word and just turn them into my personal preferences. I'll do things on my terms. You know, one of the, I'm very passionate about worship. And oftentimes we get, worship is one of those areas where we get tripped up on preferences instead of principles. Bible says, clap your hands, all the people, yeah. right? But you say, yeah, but they, I don't like this song. They should have done the other song from last week. That one I like, and I could clap more to. Or uh, I'm going to actually skip this week because uh, Pastor John plays drums too loud, you know? And, and, and he hits that snare really hard. And, and, and I'm going to skip out on, no, it, like bring earplugs, if, if there's an issue, or tell us, we'll provide them. But here's the thing. A principle of worship is we're going to gather and lift up the name of Jesus. We're going we're gonna to bring the sound of heaven on earth and release it. And worship, and we, one of the lyrics today is like, praise is a weapon. And, and we're going to release that weapon as we, as we worship through our warfare that there, there's an unseen realm in worship, in our daily lives. It's a spiritual realm. And I, I was sharing this with my kids. It was a little heavy for Josiah and Abby, maybe. But I was like, it's okay, you're going to understand. But I said, that's why I worship the way I do. Whether I'm on drums or whether I'm here. Whether I'm in my car or in my living room. For me, I'm all, it's, God, it's all for you. It's 100%. I give you my all. Until my voice runs out even. But we've turned, even in worship, and we could trip ourselves up and, and turn principles into preferences. I like it this way. I like it that way. Listen, worship is never for you or me to enjoy. Worship is for God to enjoy. Because we were created to worship, and worship wasn't for us. It's intended for Him. And so at Weston, we worship hard. I, I know when I pulled out my in-ear monitor, I could hear us singing today. I'm going to ask Priscilla to come back to the piano today. And as we close this morning, I want us to be on our tippy toes in one sense. You know when you walk too flat-footed on the heel, there's, it's a sign of being very laid back and comfortable. Maybe I walk like that at home. But... When it comes to the things of God, I like tippy toes. I played left fullback in soccer, and I close with this illustration. And my coach said, hey, Jonathan, don't just stand like this waiting for the ball because it's going to be too late when it comes. He said, you got to be on the balls of your feet, and you got to be moving so that when it comes, you're anticipating the momentum, and then you could run with the ball. You can get it as the attacker's trying to come. You get the ball, and, and you send it upfield. There's something about being on our toes and ready for what God wants to do. It says, Lord, I'm not going to treat this as casual and familiar. I'm going to treat this like it matters and like you could do just about anything. Amen? And I just believe in this moment, as we get ready to close the service, anything is possible. 
You've been contending in prayer, waiting for God to show up. I believe in this next moment, before we walk out of this place, God can touch your body. Maybe you're like, I feel as dead as a doorknob today. Guess what? His presence is about ready to flood and fill you over with the streams of living water, afresh and anew. Could you stand and join me on our feet together? I don't want to become familiar with his voice or else it's just another voice I hear out of the hundreds that I hear. But there's something special about Jesus. There's something special about his church that we are the called out ones and we're called out for a purpose to be sent back right where we came from. For some of you, it's your work or your school, your sports team. I believe some of you, it's your marriage maybe. Some of you, it's going to be right when we say amen and you go back home and, and there's an environment there that God has called you to be and to lead and to shine the light of Jesus Christ. Again, we're reflecting His image, His love, His character, His nature and His attributes. Saul, his big mistake was he heard and he did not obey. Today, we can make the exact same mistake. And I love you enough to tell you sincerely, but sternly enough. If he speaks to you and he's a God who speaks and we ought to listen, then the next step is to be a doer of the word of God and not just a form or a variation of what God has said but to do the word and carry it out fully. Why? Let me close with this. And I'm going to pray. We're going to open these altars. Whoever needs a touch, then this altar calls for you come and we're going to lay hands and we're going to spend a few minutes in God's presence. But listen carefully. The greatest tactic the devil will use is to twist what God has said in his word and to, it sounds like the truth, but it's different. To Adam and to Eve. He went to Eve. God gave the direct command to Adam. You can eat of all this, enjoy it all, but this tree here, don't touch it. But who did the serpent go to? Eve. And he said, this is his tactic. Did God really say that this tree? uh, Did God? He takes the truth and he applies his twist. And she thought about it, huh? And she believed the words, the lie that was spoken, and she ate of the fruit. Today, we're no different. We hear, this is, listen, if you don't know God's word, and you're only familiar with it, you read it, but then the devil can say, it's okay, though. You could do this, everything in moderation. You could look at other women, even though you're married, and just do it in moderation. Or or look, but don't touch. You see the twist? And then we start to justify, and we're no different than King Saul. God, help me to obey your word. Help me to not be too familiar with what you're saying. Again, familiarity will take commands and turn them into suggestions. Familiarity will take principles and make them just preferences. How many of you know your preferences could change over time? And that's why we don't lie on on preferences. We lie on the principles found in God's Word. The principles and precepts of God's Word. We need to meditate on them, learn them, and then live them out in Jesus' name. I'm going to close this service today church is not over it's just about to get started and so the challenge is let's go be the church let's go we're gonna go because that's the command go we gather and then we're gonna go in Jesus name and these altars I'm gonna open them for whoever you just need a touch in your life you need a shift maybe it's from being very familiar and just casual with the Lord and you're saying Lord light the fire again And he's saying, no, 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 you fan it into flame. You fan into flame what I've put inside of you. 
You begin to stir up the gifts that I've put inside of you. You take a step forward. And so that's really what this altar call is for. It's, it's I'm stepping out of the familiar, out of my comfort of my, even my own pew. And I'm going to come to this altar and say, Lord, just begin to break off those layers. Begin to crack the shell that I've been hiding in for too long.